Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Kun Verbis. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you here. Uh, so welcome in this uh, special webinar. Uh, it's actually uh, quite nice to have it during the Open Education Week, which is uh, just started uh, yesterday. Uh, today we'll have a special webinar um, related to the Open Online course on Programming for Geospatial Hydrological Applications. It was developed by UNESCO IHP in collaboration with UNESCO IHE. Um, so today we have the launch webinar and the course will start just after this webinar finalizes at 3.30 our time. So I would like just to go uh, through a few uh, elements. So maybe if you can go to the next slide, please. So before we start, we have a few housekeeping rules. This meeting will be recorded and will be held in English. If you have any questions, you can always use the chat box to communicate with the organizers. But also, if you have any questions, please write them down in the Q&A box or in the chat, so we can address them shortly after the presentation. We also will have a discussion session at the end. Um, so please, uh, if you would like to speak, raise your hand and we'll unmute your microphone. So you can see you have two options. Either you put your question in the Q&A box or you can also raise your hand and we will unmute you. Eventually, we'll have a mix of both during the Q&A session. So just to kick off uh, quite uh, shortly, I will go over the program and then I will give uh, the word to the uh, opening session. So we'll have a short opening session with um, uh, remarks from uh, our director and a regional representative for the UNESCO Regional Office for Southern Africa here in UNESCO, followed by director of the IG Delft Institute for Water Education, Professor Eddie Morse. Uh, continuing after the opening session, we have an overall presentation looking at the open water network, uh, looking at better water resources management tools, and uh, about sharing knowledge on water. This will be presented by Dr. Anne van Greensven, who is both uh, working at IHE as well as, uh, um, let's say, uh, working as an IHP focal point for Belgium. After that, we'll have an overview of the online course uh, given by Dr. Hans van der Quast, who is the IG Senior Lecturer in Geographic Information Systems and Spatial Data Management. After which, we will go into an open discussion and Q&A session where you can have any um, issues you want to discuss. Uh, after which, we'll announce the launch of the online course and we will finalize with some closing remarks by the head of section of the uh, hyd uh, Hydrological Systems and Water the water scarcity section in headquarters, Dr. Anil Mishra. So with that program, I would like to kick off and I would like to give the floor to our uh, director and representative for UNESCO of the Regional Office for Southern Africa, Professor Hubert Kaisen. Hubert, please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Kuhn. Uh, first of all, can you confirm that you hear me? We can hear you, we can see you. Please go ahead. Great, good, good. Yeah, thanks, Kuhn. And, uh, I would say, dear water sector colleagues and friends, uh, greetings from the UNESCO Regional Office for Southern Africa. We are based here in, uh, in Zimbabwe, in Harare, the capital, um, and cover the South Asiatic region, the Southern Africa region. A very good afternoon and, and welcome to all uh, connected to this uh, launch webinar of the online course on programming for geospatial hydrological applications. And I'm, I'm really happy to see so many of you connected. I just looked at uh, this over 200 uh, participants uh, uh, connected to this uh, launch webinar. So uh, that already indicates uh, quite uh, a broad interest in this course. And I'm also happy that uh, we are teaming up with our friends from IG Delft. Uh, good to see that uh, Eddie Morse, the rector of IG is on board. Uh, good afternoon, Eddie. Good afternoon, colleagues from IG. Uh, very happy to uh, see this joint venture uh, happening. Um, so, uh, Dear colleagues, uh, we, we all know the slogan, uh, water is life. And uh, uh, we know that without it, uh, our life expectancy uh, shrinks really to merely a few days. So uh, indeed, water is life. Uh, but uh, I would say judging from the way we manage water, it seems that water continues to be one of the most undervalued and, and probably most poorly managed resources on planet Earth. Um, climate 
change and and also changes in land use and land cover patterns have, have triggered drastic changes in the dynamics of the hydrological cycle and as a result uh, water managers face uh, considerable difficulties and uh, also uncertainty in uh, determining water availability um, to ensure water security and, and improve sustainable water management, we need to fill gaps in our understanding of the spatial and temporal distribution, but also the movement, uh, the dynamics of key elements of the hydrological cycle and uh, uh, that, that the components are, of course, uh, uh, like precipitation, uh, surface runoff, uh, groundwater, soil moisture, and evapotranspiration. The, uh, uh, the development of geospatial technologies such as GIS and, and remote sensing uh, provide really robust tools to, to monitor, to, to model, uh, to analyze, and also visualize uh, both regional and global hydrological cycles. Um, with extensive uh, spatial coverage and, and high spatial and temporal resolution. So the technology has really developed in that sense. The, uh, this uh, webinar is, is a first introductory step uh, where we try to fill this gap. Uh, we fill that gap through uh, the exposure of participants to the basic essential skills uh, that researchers need in dealing with uh, spatial data. Um, the course was developed, as Kuhn said, in a collaboration with IG Delft Institute for Water Education. Um, and it is part of uh, a UNESCO project. You saw the slide that is, uh, that is still currently on, the slide that, uh, that, that uh, gives the project title, Enhancing Climate Services for Improved Water Management. And this uh, project, uh, it seeks to build capacity for national and regional stakeholders uh, to transfer the knowledge and technology for climate services. Uh, this project uh, has contributed to the promotion and the improvement of general climate literacy uh, in line with the recommendations of the special report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Um, and, and it has done so in the uh, ocean and uh, cryptos, uh, chrys chrysosphere um, uh, in the context of a, of a changing climate. Uh, by, by strengthening the provision of reliable climate services uh, and therefore increasing resilience to climate change, uh, this project has also contributed to the realization of the, the global agreements, uh, such as the Agenda 2030 and its 17 SDGs, the Paris Agreement, but also the, the Sendai framework on disaster risk reduction. And in doing so, the, the project reinforced the, the role of uh, water, the position of water as the ultimate connector uh, among the global commitments towards a sustainable future. Uh, dear participants, this course is evidence of UNESCO's commitment to, to building a scientific knowledge base and to, to support its member states uh, to sustainably manage their water resources. Um, and this is done uh, not merely via, for instance, my office here, the regional office or all the other offices in the region. Uh, this is done through UNESCO's wider uh, water family, uh, which comprises of the, the global intergovernmental hydrological program, as you know, the IHP, but also the World Water Assessment Program, um, uh, and also uh, look at the large number of, of specialized water centers. Uh, we call them category two centers uh, that have been uh, established under the auspices of uh, UNESCO. And this, and this includes the IHC Delft Institute for Water Education. Uh, but in addition to that uh, 55 uh, uh, UNESCO water related professorial chairs as well and, and linked to that to the professorial chairs we also have the the university twinning programs and there are some very strong uni twin networks as we call them uh, in the field of uh, water 
uh, today, and as part of such uh, UNESCO Water Family initiatives, we are happy to be able to offer this course to you in close partnership with the IG uh, Institute for Water Education in Delft. Uh, in doing so, we built really on a long-standing collaboration between UNESCO and the IG Delft, uh, which date back um, a, a long time, uh, when I was still in the Institute in 2003. And at that time, the Institute joined the UNESCO Water Family as a so-called Category 1 Institute. That means uh, IG Delft became part of UNESCO. This has meanwhile changed to a category two status, uh, but we consider IG as a very important capacity building and research partner uh, in the water family. Uh, dear participants, uh, UNESCO stands ready to support its member states uh, to build a scientific knowledge base for the sustainable management of their water resources, which often are also transboundary in nature. Uh, and this course will make use of open software that is publicly available under an open license that uh, grants others the, the right of access. You, you can access it freely, you can uh, adopt it, you can adapt it, you can share it, you can study it. Uh, so the software is basically yours. In addition, uh, the course itself, so the offering of the course is also free to, to attend. And, and universities can adopt this course as, as a module, uh, attach credit points to it, uh, whatever they want to do, it is free uh, for access by all. Um, and the material, uh, the learning materials uh, are, are freely accessible on the UNESCO online learning platform. Uh, and this is of course in line with our policy, the UNESCO policy on open educational resources and also on open science. Uh, this course will equip uh, participants with the necessary skills to develop geospatial techniques, uh, improve their understanding of the hydrological cycle and to solve uh, scientific and, and practical hydrological challenges for sustainable water management. I, I really look uh, forward to, to the further expansion of this uh, fruitful cooperation with IG Delft. And I wish you all a, a most successful and productive map webinar uh, and also an, a very successful online training course. Thank you very much and uh, back to you, Kuhn. Thank you very much, uh, Hubert, uh, for those welcome remarks and also for making the link with IHE, uh, which is, of course, a very strong link. And I'm now um, very happy, uh, honored, and also uh, it's a pleasure to invite uh, Professor uh, Rector Eddie Morse to give us also a bit of an uh, introductory remarks uh, from his side. Uh, thank you very much, and please, uh, Eddie, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you, uh, Kun. Uh, just to make sure that you can hear me, I think thumbs up from... Uh, yes, Chris, uh, we can hear you. We can see you, please go ahead. Excellent. Uh, Hub, thanks also very much for uh, this, uh, I think, uh, very uh, nice introduction. I also uh, very much appreciate uh, that you mentioned the collaboration. I think uh, IG Delft is proud to be a member of the UN Water Family and also of the UNESCO Water Family, which uh, I think is a very uh, important uh, society to be a member of. And I think within this uh, collaboration, uh, we are also quite happy to uh, support an. Uh, I think um, an endeavor as this one, and uh, I think you already uh, mentioned a bit the problems that uh, we are facing, but uh, also that those problems will accelerate with the increasing population density, but also with climate change, uh, as was mentioned uh, before. Uh, what I would also like to stress is actually, and, and, and I was uh, very much touched by that, that was in uh, July last year, the Secretary General uh, announced in uh, July uh, that um, if we ever want to achieve the sustainable development goals in 2030, we need to do something. And we need to do that, especially in SDG 6, which is uh, the water uh, related uh, SDG. And he was saying this because uh, for him, it was clear that if we don't move forward within uh, the water SDG, we will also not be able to achieve all the other SDGs that strongly depend on uh, water. And that's uh, not only water availability, it's also about water quality, it's about sanitation, it's about water governance, it's about everything that touches uh, with water. 
And I think for me, that was an, an appeal that was clear. I think this course is very nice because as far as I'm concerned, we're combining three accelerators that were mentioned by the Secretary General in one go. So the first one was the capacity development. And of course, that's what you do when you do a training like this. The second one is innovation. I do think that what you will hear also uh, during the course is indeed about innovation. That's why we also think that capacity development is such an important accelerator because you need new knowledge insights if you ever want to make this acceleration to achieve the goals. And the last one is improved data and information. And of course, talking about GIS and about data, that's what, what I think is required. This later one is sometimes, I think, a little bit overlooked because people want to install pumps or other infrastructure. But if you want to be in, uh, and, and make informed decisions, uh, you need this, this information and you need the data to make the right decisions. And that's, I think, where this course is also very important for. So I do hope that in this combination of GIS and Python, where you also uh, will learn to make a an, an, an step uh, that enables you to really use this in your specific uh, case, I hope you will fully enjoy that and also will use that. In the case that you're really uh, caught up uh, by this, then uh, please feel free to contact uh, IG if you want to follow it up by another course, or if you want to collaborate on, on the research side. I think that's also quite important. And uh, I do think that it would be quite nice uh, to do that uh, under the umbrella of uh, UNESCO. So I hope that uh, it will not remain with uh, this course and this webinar, but uh, that we will be in touch uh, later on. And uh, I'm looking forward uh, to uh, your input and efforts and i hope that together we will manage to achieve the sustainable development goals of 2030. with that thanks very much uh, for um, giving me the opportunity to say a few words and i wish you a very very good uh, course and webinar thanks uh, kun thank you very much uh, eddie uh, for those words and of course indeed uh, this is a starting point as well uh, we see it as such and hopefully this could also uh, lead to further work uh, on in in the same area and i think the next presentation will be given by Dr. Anne van Grinsven is actually giving us a bit of a broader scope of how these tools and how this work uh, fits in into the water, open water network. So please, uh, Anne, if you could give us a bit of an overview of uh, that broader scope. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Eddie. Thank you very much, Kun. Um, okay, I will now first start to upload my presentation. You should see it now. I hope yes, it's, uh, it's there. Okay, thank you. Um, so I will talk about uh, the open water network, and I will try to convince all of you that it is important to have a better water resources management by sharing knowledge on water. So the background of this talk is uh, open science, which is becoming more and more important and stressed. And this is a definition of the EU that say that it's an approach to the scientific process that focuses on spreading knowledge as soon as it is available using, using digital and collaborative technologies. And we are somehow implementing this open science within the water domain through the open water network. And the main goal of the open water network is to share knowledge knowledge on open software, open source software and open access tools, all within the domain of water. So to support water resources, engineering and management. So we started with this in 2011 with uh, an open water symposium that was organized at IHG Delft um, to where we, in, where we had uh, both uh, presentations as well as, as workshops of uh, open source tools um, and this was a big success so we, we, we decided to continue so it has been organized more or less every two years as a kind of a physical meeting offering a platform for presentations to share new results as well as to, to provide training through uh, workshops in computer rooms typically organized. So we did this further in Brussels, Addis Ababa. This was also supported by UNESCO, another one in Brussels, Arusha. And then the last one 
uh, we had before COVID uh, somehow disrupted uh, physical meanings was in, uh, organized in Rabat, uh, funded through UNESCO. Uh, so that's how we started, uh, but that's not where we are now, of course. We are more uh, going, moving towards uh, online activities. Um, so we are building at this moment an open water network platform where we also provide access to open source software and data and, and knowledge. Uh, so here you can see, uh, or we are, it's a work on the process, but we are providing access to e-learning data uh, and, and we are building a uh, platform for Internet of Things. Uh, we provide uh, access to software uh, through a GitHub repository. So this is somehow an access point to a lot of information and knowledge on open source software and data for water applications. Um, I think important in this is, is the e-learning material. This is something we are getting more and more involved. It already started before COVID, but it's of course also accelerated through the COVID situations we are in now. Um, so we are now moving more from providing access to data and software also to providing access to open education for water resources, engineering and management. Uh, at this moment, we are still in initial steps to build a Moodle open water network platform where we aim at uh, providing course materials uh, that can be used by different programs across the world that want to provide courses on, on hydrology or water resources management or other uh, topics that are typically uh, given in, in, in water education. So this is something we are recently starting. And of course, like today, we are also getting more and more involved in webinars. We are also offering webinars. Uh, I will just uh, mention the one we are currently also uh, offering. Uh, it's a webinar on uh, water resources management using Internet of Things technologies, remote sensing and citizen science. So you can see it's running uh, right at the moment. Uh, all these courses are also offered uh, through, through, through our uh, YouTube channel. And also important is the support we got for these webinars from UNESCO IHP, but also the uh, strong collaboration with the uh, EMWRE project, which I, I will just explain briefly. It's a, a project where we develop an e-master uh, on water resources engineering, and this is done uh, together with UNESCO IHG and PUB, the Free University of Brussels, who's coordinating this uh, project, but of course with partners in uh, Palestine territories and, and Jordan, uh, because the, the overall goal is to run this master uh, in the Middle East, in, in Palestine and Jordan. So this is uh, also a very important project that helps us to push further the e-learning activities that we are uh, doing at the moment. So this is, I think, a bit the, be the background of the Open Water Network, but also where we are going further. Uh, so summarizing, we focus on, let's say, three components, uh, open data, where the main activity now is going towards the uh, uh, Internet of Things platform, but we also offer uh, workshops on data management. Uh, GIS, of course, is also very important in this context. Um, we, we, we provide access to free open source software, uh, where the GitHub repository is the main uh, platform for this, and open education. So here we are offering several webinars, online trainings. Uh, we also have a very popular YouTube channel with thousands of uh, views of certain uh, videos that we posted there. Uh, and we are at this moment also building this Moodle platform to support um, water education masters uh, worldwide. So uh, the key is the sharing. That's the main thing we are doing. We share. We data, tools, information, knowledge. And with this, we want to support citizen science, for instance, with the Internet of Things platform, but also to support community model developments, uh, like we see, for instance, uh, in the soil and water assessment tool. Uh, but we also more and more want to provide open education on water topics. 
But the final goal is to, at the end, support and promote knowledge-based and transparent decision-making. Um, and we see in the COVID situation that this is becoming more and more important to, in, to use science and experts in the decision-making. We also realize more and more that this will become very important within the climate change context. So um, definitely this is uh, an end goal, which is just very important. So that's my main uh, message of today. And thank you all. And you're all, of course, welcome to join the Open Water Network or to view one of our videos or, or the materials that we provide through our uh, Open Water Network platform. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Anne, for that overview of the Open Water Network and all the tools and methodologies that uh, will be accessible through the platform. And of course, the linkages with uh, both IHP and uh, IHE as well. So thanks for that. And uh, I think we can then uh, move towards the topic of the day, which is uh, to give a bit of an overview of the online course on programming for geospatial hydrological applications. And that will be provided by the main um, author of the course, Dr. Hans van der Quast. As I mentioned, he's the IG uh, senior lecturer on geographic information systems and spatial data management. So please, uh, Hans, the floor is yours. Hello, I uh, hope you can see uh, the screen. We can, we can see you and we can hear you. So the floor is yours. Great, thank you. Thank you for the nice uh, introduction uh, presentations, which uh, clearly uh, shows the importance of uh, sharing uh, knowledge and sharing uh, data, open education. Um, and this course specifically is a course that I have been thinking about a long time and there were bits and pieces that were ready. <laughs> Uh, but I never had a chance to really uh, put it all together in one course that really addresses uh, the basic user who wants to kick off with programming and to maybe in a later stage develop uh, him or herself further in uh, using programming languages for uh, geospatial hydrological applications. So I'm very happy to in this uh, open education week and uh, co collaboration with, uh, with the UNESCO uh, Water Institute's and others to make this uh, possible. Just a short introduction about myself as being the lecturer of this course. I'm a physical geographer uh, by background. I studied at uh, Utrecht University in the Netherlands. I did my PhD uh, at the same university together also with ITC, University of Twente nowadays, um, which was about linking satellite information with uh, soil moisture modeling. And there I already started to learn a lot of uh, Python. We didn't in those days have uh, classes in that. So I had to learn things myself, but always was supported by other people and sharing knowledge, uh, which also happened when I started working at uh, VITO in Belgium, the Flemish Institute for Technological Research. A great time where we had a, a good team of people working on Python and we had regular meetings to share knowledge. We had a wiki page. And then in 2012, I started at uh, IHC Delft. Um, and there uh, I had some short courses, which I still have on, uh, uh, on programming, um, which has some elements of this course, but this course, of course, a bit more uh, extended. Uh, and I've also been working a lot on uh, advocacy for open data and open source software. I'm a board member of the Dutch uh, QGIS user group and uh, co-author of the book QGIS for Hydrological Applications, which gives a yeah, good basics on how to use uh, QGIS for um, analysis of catchments and uh, data uh, on hydrology. Uh, my main interests are open source GIS and modeling. I'm also a QGIS certified instructor at IHE. We also offer the certified courses. Uh, integration of remote, sen remote sensing for hydrology. I work since the beginning of this year with uh, the water accounting and water productivity uh, team. Um, which do very interesting things with linking GIS remote sensing to hydrology. Um, I've been doing also uh, workshops for the Open Water Network uh, that Anne already mentioned uh, related to spatial data infrastructures, the sharing of data. And um, so one of my important things in uh, capacity development projects that I do for IHE. And uh, of course, field work and field data collection is also a nice thing. Um, if you want to be in touch with me, uh, I'm on 
social media and uh, you can contact me by email. And if you're enrolled to the course and you have questions about the course, then Akum will tell later where you can post your questions about the course. So let's uh, talk a bit about this course. The learning objectives of this course are that you will be able at the end to manage files and folders using the command line interface, to use GDAL from the command line to convert GIS formats and reproject GIS files, to use the command line for batch processing, to make scripts in Python, to use the PC raster Python library for map algebra and raster analysis, to use also PC raster for dynamic modeling to create your own spatial temporal models in Python, and uh, finally, to use PyQGIS inside of the QGIS desktop and outside of it. And in this presentation, I'll give you a little tour along these different uh, objectives and the modules. But first, I think you are in the right course because it is an essential skill. It, it was already mentioned in one of the previous uh, presentations in this webinar um, because it will really save you time in the future. If you need to process the, the big amounts of data that are available now on the internet, the big data movement, artificial intelligence, then doing that all through a, a interface, a user interface by clicking uh, would not uh, bring you much forward and it will cost a lot of time. And scripting languages allow that you can automate processes, uh, do batch processing, do more advanced type of analysis and even do spatial dynamic modeling. We will be looking at the so-called high-level scripting languages uh, that are closer to the way of thinking of scientists. So we don't have to bother about bits and bytes and, and where the memory uh, is managed in the computer, but we write code that is uh, very similar to the way of uh, how uh, scientists uh, write their um, yeah, expressions, I would say. Uh, examples of those high-level scripting and programming languages are uh, DOS batch files or Linux uh, shell scripts. Uh, many of the engineers use uh, MATLAB. We will use here Python, which uh, is free and can do the same and more uh, compared to MATLAB. Uh, there are some other languages and we will cover PC Raster. Ours is very popular for, um, for modeling and uh, also has a very good uh, statistical analysis toolkit that you can use also for spatial analysis. Uh, but we have the, no time in this course to, to cover that. So why should I learn scripting? So automation, as said, can save you a lot of time, but scripts also keep things consistent and make it portable. You can share the script with another person and uh, things become reproducible and uh, people can reuse and build on it if it's readable and if you uh, have good practice in writing your scripts. And it looks a bit scary from the first time if you look at such a black screen with a lot of code, but it's not as difficult as you think. And if you are not learning these skills at this moment, someone else will, and I will show you some statistics on that. Some examples. There was some uh, years ago, um, a student and uh, she was converting 800 MODIS HDF images. That's a kind of data type uh, for a satellite image. And she wanted to convert it to a GeoTIFF. It's not this example that's here on the screen, but it's related. And after 300, she came to me. She, did, she was doing 300 by hand in QGIS, which works, but it just takes a lot of time. And this code here on the screen shows that you can solve it just in a couple of lines of code. It's not exactly the same example, but this one converts all the TIFF files to a new projection and it clips it through a, a polygon uh, a cut line that you give and uh, it's put in a batch file and in this way you can in a few lines of code process the whole folder and um, yeah take a cup of coffee and come back and it's done but i found that that was an essential skill uh, missing in the curriculum and i still see that at universities it is not mainstream to have these kind of courses in the curriculum that can save later a lot of time but as i will show later it will also have a high value on the labor market Here's another example where we have a model output for uh, 30 years uh, of a land use change model. And with this uh, script of 15 lines, we can convert uh, the format that comes out of the model is the Idrisi format to the PC raster time series format to uh, be further used. And uh, it's just 15 lines of code that runs in a few minutes, uh, all the files in the folder. And if you have to do that by clicking, it would probably take uh, at least an hour. 
And for larger data sets, uh, it can take you days to do that by hand. There was a Python script and why learn Python? Well, when I worked at, Py at uh, Vito, uh, we had this slogan that Python is the duct tape of uh, the programming languages. You can use it for uh, multiple functions. It's not specialized in something specific. It's you, the user, the programmer who decides how to use it. And it's open source. So you can contribute to Python itself, but you can also, without a license, share your code and people can run the code. Also, if you work somewhere else, you can share the code with your colleagues and they simply have to have some knowledge about running Python code. And it uh, runs on any platform, Windows, Linux, um, Mac. And as I said, it's multi-purpose. So you need to determine what you're going to use it for. In this course, we'll focus, of course, on uh, geospatial hydrological applications, but you can use it for data mining, uh, a lot of things that are uh, mentioned here, CFD modeling, uh, and all kinds of different uh, data processing that you can do with big data. As promised, uh, I show you here that there's a big demand in the labor market to have these skills. Uh, this was a search I did yesterday uh, for this presentation. And you can see that uh, almost 400,000 Python jobs are posted uh, for worldwide jobs on uh, LinkedIn. So with this skill, uh, you, you become valuable for the labor market. But also if you stay in, uh, in academia or become a researcher, it is essential. But as you see here, it's also in the, in the, uh, in the industries. The course consists of uh, five modules that cover these uh, different uh, learning objectives. The first module is an introduction to the command line interface and uh, GDAL. Then you will get an introduction to Python with all the concepts of Python. It's an object-based programming language, so you're introduced to these uh, concepts. Then we are going to use Python libraries for map algebra, followed by a module on dynamic modeling with the PC Raster Python framework, and then the PyQGIS uh, language is, that is used in QGIS, but also outside of QGIS, you can use it. Let's start with what is offered in the first module the command line interface. And yeah, that's when I start feeling really old. By coincidence, today is also my birthday, but with this slide, I feel really old. And uh, when we started communicating and also reviewing the course, uh, a lot of nostalgia came up with uh, other people uh, organizing this course because uh, people of my age grew up with um, computers that ha didn't have a graphical user interface and you use the command line, the DOS box here, you see an example in the upper right to communicate with the computer and to execute uh, commands and to run programs. And I realized that uh, somewhere early 2000s when I uh, started working as a lecturer at Utrecht University that the first generation uh, students arrived that have never worked with DOS. And the first question that made me realize it was, uh, lecturer, I have a problem. I can't delete this. I can't remove this C uh, period backslash strange thing. And uh, I said, yeah, that's the prompt and you need to type your commands after that. So a lot of nostalgia when, when I grew up, uh, we started running code for, for games and these programs still uh, run on your mobile phone, for example. But this example of Snake was also my first um, exposure to programming for uh, for GIS, when I was at Utrecht University, we had to make the snake game in our uh, spatial programming course in, in those days. Python didn't exist yet, so we used other languages. But nowadays, you, you could program that also in Python. It's a spatial problem. You need to keep track of where the snake is. And there are all kinds of rules that shouldn't hit itself or the walls. So it's a, it's a dynamic geographical problem that you need to solve. But okay, uh, all this nostalgia, all uh, great fun for uh, for the old folks here. But what do I in the 21st century need to do with, with DOS, with the command line? Well, it is very important and still very relevant because you will need that knowledge of your navigating through your file system with uh, command line commands. In the course, you will learn about absolute and relative paths. You will learn how to change the directories, how to copy files, all these things. And this is often missing in these kind of courses. And I find it very valuable that, uh, yeah, that you learn this and we don't assume that you already uh, know these things. 
it's also important that you know what is behind user interfaces that you use when you drag and drop files in your uh, Windows Explorer, all these commands are still uh, executed in the back end. And also those batch files that we use to automate things, they are still used. I did a search on my uh, modern laptop and I found 820 batch files on my computer. So it might look old and dusty in those uh, black DOS boxes and with all this code, but it is still very relevant. And I would say an essential skill to, to have if you go into programming for geospatial applications. After introducing you to the command line interface, we go into uh, using the command line interface to perform uh, GDAL commands, which is one of the most important tools used in GIS. I always say to my students, if I'm dropped on Mars and I don't have uh, QGIS with me or any other GIS software, but I have GDAL, I can still do a decent uh, amount of my work because most of the buttons you push in GIS uh, or that Google uses, or it's probably on many tools that you use and run even on your mobile phone, uh, GDAL uh, is a component in that. It translates raster and uh, vector data and projections, and uh, it's uh, also an essential skill that you need to learn. Here you see how it's used in QGIS. If you reproject a file, you fill in the dialogue, and you see that um, it builds up this command. And now in the course, you will learn how to build up these commands yourself. And if you want to automate things, then this is much easier to loop over if it's a scripting language than to every time fill in the dialogue and run. Therefore, if I had face-to-face -face classes with all of you, I would normally give you this uh, button. It's a bit of a word joke. I don't like buttons. I love coding. I hope you get enthusiastic about it uh, also in this uh, online uh, open course. And then, GDAL uh, can use, be used in the QGIS uh, interface. It can be used at the DOS command line or the command line interface of Windows or Linux or whatever, but you can also use it as a library in Python. So you will also learn how to import uh, libraries. That's the real power of Python, uh, where you can integrate it with other Python code for pre-processing your data and then visualizing or do modeling. But what's this Python? What has it to do with Snake? It has nothing to do with the Snake uh, game, but uh, it was developed in the early 90s by a Dutch uh, developer, Guido van Rossen, for the Mathematics Institute in Amsterdam. And uh, he worked for Google and Dropbox too, but uh, he's now retired and Python is now maintained by the Python Software uh, Foundation. It's open source and it's further developed and improved further. And it is, not named after Snake, but after Monty Python. I felt a bit in my first classes uh, that it has the same effect of explaining the DOS boxes to young students, but uh, this is also something that you, uh, something culturally that you need to experience. So if you don't know if Monty Python doesn't ring any bell to you, just after this webinar, go to YouTube and search for Ministry of Silly Walks. And then uh, that's the kind of humor that uh, the uh, developer of Python uh, appreciated and uh, therefore called the software, the programming language uh, Python. And it's really funny. And in a face-to-face -face class, I would always show a ministry of silly walks. So what's specific about Python and why uh, did we choose for that language? Um, again, it's general purpose. So it's not specifically for statistics or for GIS. Those skills can be used uh, for any um, yeah, thing that you need scripting and programming for. It's high level, so it's very readable. At first you would say, well, he said it was very readable, but when you get used to it throughout the course, you will be able to, uh, to see that it's more uh, human readable. It's really a language that focuses on the readability. It uses the indentation instead of all kinds of strange brackets and uh, ugly looking things. And it supports uh, different programming paradigms, object-oriented, as I already said. It's imperative. You don't need to compile it. And it has a very functional and procedural style. You will learn more about that in uh, the course. Dynamic type system. You don't have to declare everything specifically before. It will know what you mean, but you can, of course, override the, the typing of uh, the data. It will take care of the things that you, as a researcher, don't want to take care of, the automatic memory management, for example. And already the standard Python has a comprehensive uh, set of functions that you can use. But that's not the real power. The real power is in the libraries 
it's not like this beautiful library uh, of the, the Rijks Museum in Amsterdam, but it's a digital library of code. And uh, there are really a lot of libraries and we can only cover very few of them to give you a gist of what uh, libraries are, but they add extra functionality from third party to Python and NumPy is an important one that uses MATLAB style arrays to do calculations in Python. And you can convert uh, GIS maps to NumPy array format and do all kinds of matrix calculations with it. If you bring that to another level, uh, you'll probably need pandas for a data processing, um, a very advanced uh, library and uh, matplotlib for plotting. We'll briefly cover this in the course, but our main um, accent on libraries goes to map algebra with PC raster. And for the course, I translated my um, QGIS course on map algebra to Python. So you're going to do exactly the same exercise as in the, in the book and in the online courses, uh, QGIS for hydrological applications and solve this problem of finding um, wells that are accessible in a study area uh, following this workflow, but then in Python code. And the great thing is in the end, you have a piece of code that you can play with and run it again for different scenarios. If you want to change these conditions, you just change the, the values in the script and run it again. While in a graphical user interface, you need to do a lot of clicking and repeating the whole process. The second thing that you will learn is to interpolate uh, groundwater levels using scripting. We will have borehole data, groundwater level data um, from an open data set that we will interpolate with different methods and we'll discuss uh, the different results. Here you see uh, IDW interpolation and uh, TSEN polygons, very colorful here. The third component uh, in that um, map algebra a part is the stream and catchment delineation, uh, very important in our work, uh, where we also repeat the whole procedure that is uh, in the QGIS for hydrological applications book and courses. But then without clicking, we start with the same four uh, GeoTIFF uh, SRTM tiles, open data, and we end up with the rivers in the, in the Ruhr catchment and uh, catchment boundary and the flow direction using these uh, PC raster operators. And the great thing is that you can use the same in uh, modeling. That will be the next step to uh, develop a, a rainfall runoff model. Um, we will use as an example, the stream model that has been applied um, in, in different places, but we will look at uh, the Mara River Basin. And uh, then you can, uh, in the end, have this uh, discharge uh, result in space and in time. And for every pixel, you can get a discharge. Then we will dive into uh, PyQGIS, where you're going to uh, make this tool, the stage volume tool, by uh, using uh, PyQGIS in the QGIS interface. And the stage volume uh, is basically um, a bit like a rating curve, but then for lakes or, or pits, where you know which volume is in the pit uh, corresponding with a certain uh, elevation level that you measure. And by using uh, the script, you will get this result, a stage volume table. And it gives us for different uh, levels of the pit, different elevations, how much volume is there. And you see here that if you use the data plotly dialog, you can make easily this graph. So this is the stage volume curve where you only need to measure the water level in a lake, for example, and read then the volume. Then we're going to repeat that, but then in PyQGIS outside of QGIS, and we end up also with the graph, but then in Python, completely Python without touching the interface. The examples that you've seen here uh, use Jupyter Notebooks. That is uh, a technology that we use for these uh, courses. Part will be in walkthrough uh, step-by-step manuals on the uh, Open edX e-learning uh, platform. But part of it will also be Jupyter Notebooks, of which a certain part, the beginning, you will run them completely online, but later you learn how to run them locally uh, on your computer. Jupyter stands for Julia, Python, and R. And uh, it's very interactive. You see immediately your results, and you can also plot uh, maps and graphs there. And it comes with uh, uh, Anaconda that you're going to install on your computer. And those materials are on GitHub, which you can also further develop and use in your own courses if you want. And we access that through also very nice technology 
to a binder that can run Jupyter notebooks from your GitHub. And Google also has a similar tool, Colabs, collaborative collaboratory, where you can also run this from the repository. That was my uh, presentation, which give you, uh, gave you a tour along the course. I hope it uh, makes you enthusiastically to, to join and to follow this course. And I hope it also shows the importance of these essential skills for your uh, future career, whether it's in uh, private sector or in academia. I think it's very important. I give the floor back to, uh, to Kun. Right, thank you very much, uh, Hans. And actually, just before I continue, uh, first, I would like to wish you a happy birthday. And I think this must be your largest and most global birthday party so far with more than 300 participants. So I think, uh, thank you for uh, making time during this uh, precious day. And of course, uh, wish you uh, good health and, uh, and, and a good birthday uh, later on. Thank so I think much. we're now... <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so now we're actually at the point where we want to uh, hear from you. I can just get the agenda uh, up there. We have some open discussion and uh, we have some uh, early questions, but we also have some hands up. So maybe we can um, we can give uh, first to colleagues um, the floor. So if you want to uh, raise a question, please raise your hand. Uh, sometimes you do that by accident. So make sure that if uh, if you raise your hand, you do it on purpose to ask a question so that we can indeed uh, hear from you which you would like to raise. I see three hands up. Um, I will start with those. And at the same time, we'll um, manage some of the questions from the Q&A box. So I'll give the floor to Kinilwi Mushi. So um, if you're able to speak, um, please unmute your mic and then you can ask a question. Go ahead. Hi, Dr. Weber. I have two questions that hopefully can be answered within the given time. The first one is I work for uh, the biosphere in South Africa and with, this, with me attending this course will mean transcending the information to my fellow colleagues and other people I work with. So how, what's the prerequisite information or what's the prerequisite knowledge that my fellow colleagues need to have for this course. The second one is how much time will I need for this course if I myself have to take the course? Thank you. Thank you for your question. On the first one, the, the prerequisites, uh, I think you need for these kind of courses a decent uh, knowledge of computers. So uh, if you're already struggling with finding your way on your computer, then this might not be uh, the course for you because we really uh, um, need to go into uh, to the command line and finding things on, on the disk and also you need to have interest in it. But besides that, it's a beginner's course. So if you are uh, aware of how, how you use your computer, then uh, it should be feasible uh, with logical thinking to, uh, to get uh, through this course. There are no other prerequisites. Your uh, second question, um, can you repeat that again? Sorry, I was muted. My second question was how much time will I need like weekly because I'm doing this off work. Yeah. So uh, we can only estimate it. It depends a bit on your own uh, speed, uh, how, how fast you grasp uh, the knowledge. Uh, but I estimate it at around 40 hours and we spread it out over uh, two months in the course. So uh, that would be as a, at a normal average uh, pace, I think, uh, that, that you can uh, expect that kind of effort. Thank All right, you so thank you. Uh, we have another person who would like to speak, uh, Oredice Kesalopa. You can unmute if you want. We give it one more try. What it did say, if you want to speak, this is your um, option to do so. If not, we'll give it to the following person. Okay, so I have Mohammed as well. Please, Mohammed, if you want, you can unmute yourself. Hello, everybody. 
I am Mohammed. I'm a PhD candidate and a researcher at Kuzailul University uh, at Water Resource Management Research and Application Center. Uh, I have some limited experience in spatial scripting. Uh, I would like to ask the instructor about the way of uh, automation processing in QGIS. Uh, in general, uh, I have this uh, problem with uh, this path is to define uh, the list of uh, TIFF files or even the list of uh, vectors. Uh, so if, since you, you already mentioned the absolute and relative path, uh, if during the course, do we'll have some uh, examples how we can recall uh, the GIS material, let's say TIFF files, thousands of TIFF files to do the same process within QGIS because I think in the other ISRI products, it's taking the absolute path directly, but in QGIS, I have a lot of difficulties in this course. Uh, so if you can just uh, enlighten me in this point, I would be grateful. Thank you. I think that would be uh, mostly covered. And uh, if you still have questions about it, then, uh, then you can use the discussion forum there. But um, as far as I know, it uh, should not be uh, too difficult with, uh, with the steps offered to, uh, to load your files from disk in, uh, in QGIS, with PyQGIS, of course. OK. We also have Pius Onoha. To uh, speak, so I'll, I'll unmute you if you want. Pius, if you want to Hello. speak, go ahead. Hello. Yes, we can hear you. Go ahead. Well, my question will be when will the program commence and uh, what is the financial obligation? Right, I think we will have that just after the discussion. I will show you how to get to the course. I will share the link, uh, but also it's not an, uh, a paid course. It's, uh, it's an open course, meaning that anybody who wants can join the course. So there is no cost attached to, to joining uh, that course. And it will be open for two months. And it actually okay. uh, starts in about two minutes from now. So after this session, you can actually start uh, learning. Okay, that's good. Thank you. Uh, hello, can you hear me? Uh, well, I think you, you hear me now. Do you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, well, thank you first to the IHE, to UNESCO, to uh, the Clean War Operation for letting us uh, to study this course uh, as an open course. Uh, uh, thank you to Hans and uh, giving him a congratulation for his happy birthday. Uh, I would like to uh, make a question more about uh, how we can explode the skills that we are gonna learn in this um, uh, course. And my uh, specific question could be how to convey all the insights from the data processing uh, to decision makers. Uh, graph maps can be a good option or is it better to prepare documents uh, and even, for example, uh, Jupyter notebooks to uh, transfer or to convey the, those insights to decision makers. Thank you. That's a very relevant uh, question. Uh, here in this course, we target uh, people who do the work to process data and to uh, to do the modeling, etc. That's that's not necessarily at the stage already to, to communicate uh, results to the policy maker, which it would be a study on itself. Um, I, I have some teaching materials on that where I always explain that you need to really well know who your uh, end users are. And uh, normally uh, this stuff that you learn in this course is, is more at the, the scientific side where you go into prototyping and check your theories and making your model. If it needs to be in a production environment, you would probably need to work together with a software engineer to make a, a decision support system or to put it on, the, on a website in a web uh, uh, development uh, uh, interface. 
So um, these, these are all choices you need to, uh, to make for the end product. And we are at the beginning of that uh, whole process in this course, but there is a whole trajectory. How do you bring it to the, to the client and what do you communicate? And it's also very cultural. Are our users used to looking at maps and graphs or does it need to be more narrative or do you need to make videos of it? Um, so that's a whole world of things that you can explore and Python can be part of that, but you also need probably other skills for that. Okay, thank you for that. And we have also Churner Jallo. If you want, you can also take the floor. Churner, if you want, you can speak, go ahead. Yes, hello, my name is Churner. I'm from Sierra Leone. I joined LIT because of internet constraints. But I want to know if the material that we are presented will be available also some of my colleagues at the office want to be part, but they, we are not registered. Is there a way that they could be part of the, 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 the program? Thank you. Right, maybe on, on offline learning, it might be interesting. We could share maybe some of the documents, but I think for um, purposes of accessing the material, you would need to be able to at least register once. Uh, and get access to the course. The, the course is free, and as I will indicate in the next presentation, uh, you can see how you can uh, register, and it's still open. We currently have over 850 people registered uh, to the course, so it's, there's no limit to that. So if anybody else wants to join, they're, they're free to do so. Maybe Hans, if you want to come in in terms of offline information, if people can um, access it uh, offline in some way. Yes, um, the, most of the materials can also be accessed uh, offline. If you have any problems with uh, the materials in the beginning uh, to make it easier for you are offered online, but with the things you learn a bit later, you could also download them and use them offline. But then you will not have that knowledge yet. So if you struggle with that, just post it in the discussion uh, at the e-learning platform. So uh, I can guide you to where you can find how to use it locally already, but you might need to uh, jump a few steps in your learning curve to do that. All right, I see some two more hands up. I have Karimula Sifat. I will give you access to speak. Please go ahead to mute yourself. We have some challenges hearing you. Yeah, a little bit uh, cut up. Maybe if you can uh, speak can, very slowly. Uh, thank you for. Yeah, thank you so much for such a uh, providing such a helpful uh, webinar. Uh, my question is uh, that uh, will this uh, scripting, uh, Python scripting, which will be covered in this uh, course, be? Oh, thank you. Uh, my question is that uh, will the Python scripting uh, which is covered in this uh, course will be uh, applicable with the ArcGIS? I mean, uh, can we use the scripting along with the ArcMap? Thank you. You will learn uh, general knowledge of uh, Python scripting, which is applicable to any uh, software that uses uh, Python but for specific uh, um, ArcPy functionality, you need to learn that and you need to have a license to uh, run that. We will not cover that in the course. All right, so indeed it can be generally useful, but of course we're not specifically focusing on proprietary software here, since uh, ArcGIS of course needs a license, but of course if uh, you know uh, Python, you can use it in any other application you would like, such as uh, also ArcGIS. Uh, I have uh, one more speaker uh, asking for the floor. That's uh, Sponizo Njaja. Please go ahead. Njaja, please go ahead. Oh, um, hi, Dr. Kuhn and colleagues. Um, my question is more with regard to GIS. Um, I see that the, the program um, is focused more on GIS and programming in Q. 
Um, so I just wanted to know if there are any, you know, causes, because I'm not someone who has been working with Q mostly. Um, I have been more exposed to ArcGIS rather than Q. So I just wanted to know if there are any causes that um, Prof can recommend with regards to learning more about QGIS, which are open source or otherwise. Thank you. Yes, thank you for your question. Um, last Friday, I had a webinar um, as part of the QGIS Open Day about open education for QGIS. Um, I can uh, share the link if I can uh, quickly uh, find it. Um, but there, uh, there are def different examples where to find resources and the best place to go uh, for you is gisopencourseware.org. Uh, which is a site maintained by IHC Delft, and I'm the moderator, where we share uh, courses on open source GIS uh, for free, but also without support and without certificate, but just for yourself to learn more about it. And the course QGIS for Hydrological Applications, the translations of that are freely available. We have it now in French. So if you're from a French country, you can follow that whole course. French speaking country, you can follow that whole course um, for free. Uh, we have it. I, think also in Portuguese now. Yes, a translator from Brazil. Uh, they're working on it in Chinese. Uh, Italian is being worked on in Arabic. So there will be uh, translations available uh, soon. So it should be uh, not too difficult to get started with uh, QGIS. Uh, if you need the English um, course for QGIS for online, uh, QGIS for hydrological applications, then that's a, a paid course offered by IHG or you get the book uh, QGIS for hydrological applications this one, uh, which is uh, $35 for the ebook. Um, thank you very much for that. Looking for it to just was out for a minute um, due to a short cut in internet. Um, I do see there's a few questions, um, hands that um, are looking about um, applications. So I have uh, Ahmed uh, writing about a uh, one with knowledge gained by this course will be used for developing geospatial flood forecasting system as I'm researching develop a model. Um, a similar question on applications is about, um, I'm, I'm more interested in, in more general applications. Uh, for example, computer sciences, can, can I also use that for this kind of applications? And also uh, another person burns, um, does the course need to have a practical project? I work in the plantation in Northern Mindanao, Philippines on soil conservation and managing hydrology is key. I think they're, they're focusing a bit more on the applicability of the course uh, tools that you will be sharing. Yeah, this course will provide you a fundament. So you have to really see it as a, as a sturdy, strong fundament that will help you to build on to uh, go into more advanced applications that are also from different fields. Um, these kind of courses, uh, of course, need to choose certain themes and it's also how we, uh, we frame it. Uh, but you will see that the things that you learn uh, are also very useful, especially the first few uh, models uh, modules that you, uh, you will get. And then maybe the PC raster and PyQGIS will be a bit more specific to certain applications, but still it will develop your ideas of what you can do with Python in uh, other applications. All right, thank you. There's also quite a lot of questions on the type of, um, I mean, uh, software specifically on QGIS, which version. I think that that will be clear when people take the course itself, but also maybe some reference to R. Some people say, oh, we also have R. How do you relate uh, this course to an R course? And 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 actually R is even older. Um, so maybe just to have a bit of reflection on that. I, um, I want to comment maybe, to that one. Yeah. Go ahead. I don't think it's older uh, because it's around the same time that it started. It's not 2009 because I have been working with Python already in uh, 2003. Um, so it's, it's much uh, older and they're very equivalent. And I've learned both 
So I think if you get the whole concept and the logics of uh, high level programming languages, uh, then it doesn't matter where you start, but you can apply it uh, to other languages too. So if you have learned R, then uh, you, you probably have it much easier to, uh, to follow the first part of, uh, of Python and vice versa. And uh, I don't make choices in that. It just depends on your background, what you feel uh, comfortable with. They're both, both open source and we, I use them both in, uh, in my work at Utrecht University uh, with Edzer Pebesma, for example, who's one of the developers also, Professor Pebesma in, uh, in the spatial functionality and the geostatistical functionality of R. So uh, I don't take sides there. All right, I think that's fine. I don't see any, I mean, there's a few questions more on, on techno, technical things, but I think also when we look into the cause itself, uh, that would be addressed. Uh, maybe a very specific question, um, the script you're developing, can it also be used for dams? I think it would, but maybe you can uh, give some reflection on that. Um, the stage volume yeah, for dams. Mentioned. But that's, uh, that's an engineering application. Uh, I'm more in, in the geography domain that would be about planning uh, dams. We have some master students who have been uh, working on that also in, uh, in QGIS to develop tools for that. And you can do that also in uh, Python. Um, but uh, yeah, I don't, uh, we don't really address that. We need to make choices. But the things that you learn, like the catchment delineation process, are really uh, necessary if you also want to plan dams, for example. Okay, thank you very much. I don't see any hands up, so I think uh, we exhausted a bit the questions, and I think we're also quite on time for this um, question and answer session. If there's anything urgent in terms of questions, please uh, keep asking. We'll respond. Some simpler question, like for example, will I be fine using a Mac? I think uh, you already answered that. Uh, that it's indeed Should also be. compatible. Right? The the yep. thing about Mac, maybe I can comment on that briefly. Um, because I don't have a Mac and I never tried <laughs> using my courses on a Mac. So the, the DOS commands that you will learn in the force module are not applicable to Mac because as far as I understand the Mac interface based on uh, Unix and uh, you need to use the bash commands, but we use an emulator so you can still use the commands uh, in, of the course, but then in the emulator, but not on your own computer. So things will work differently and I might not be able to offer support. So you're taking a little risk there, but it should work, but you need a good understanding of how a Mac works. And I don't have that. Okay, that's fine. And of course, if you have any issues, you can always write to us uh, using the open learning email address that also will be accessible through uh, the course. And uh, I think it's a good uh, moment because many of the questions are now related to the course itself. So maybe go into that and I would maybe ask my colleagues to uh, switch to the next uh, slide so that we can uh, basically have a look at that. All right, so uh, just a very, in a very uh, few slides, um, I would like to um, guide you to the online platform. I'll ask my colleagues also to share the link. Uh, so there's two links on this page. Uh, on one hand, you have direct link to the course, uh, which is uh, the upper one. But if you want to register and you haven't done so, the easier way is to go to the uh, openlearning.unesco.org address. You can register and then you can enroll in any of the courses, including the programming for geospatial hydrological applications one, which should already be live for about 15 minutes. So you can actually just after this uh, workshop, straight go to the course and you should be able to access uh, the materials. And all those materials, you can see the next slide, uh, how they look. Um, so if everything goes well, you should be able to see uh, on your left hand side, there is a course outline. And that uh, basically allows you to go through all the modules. You have five modules here that were explained already by Hans. And basically after that, you also have a final assignment, which we're uh, finalizing. And then you have a course evaluation and certificate element. Uh, which I will come back to how you obtain a certificate of uh, completion. Now, also, we have a discussion part uh, of this course, um, and we would like to invite you to, if you have any questions specifically related to any module, uh, we have included, uh, please, next slide, a, um, a discussion, discussion element after each module. 
So you can always uh, ask questions to the uh, course developer as well as your co-learners. We also invite the co-learners to answer questions that you know the answer of, so that we also share the, let's say, the burden of um, looking after uh, any issues or questions that may arise. As you, as you have indicated, Hans, as well, uh, it's a uh, self-paced course, which means that there is no uh, immediate attention to the course. Uh, we, of course, will check the discussion forum uh, over time and see if any issues need to be solved, so we will do so. But it's not that we will be uh, continuously uh, checking the discussion forum. There's also a, um, a wiki forum, which in this case, I think is quite relevant. Um, we would like to build together with you kind of a repository of, um, of code that could be relevant for uh, applications. So in this sense, we put a first, um, let's say, uh, brick in the wall uh, by providing kind of a uh, starting point for such a wiki where you can extract some of the lessons learned from the courses and, and add them to the wiki, which is visible to all. Uh, but also, of course, if you have your own elements to add that can be relevant, it can also be implemented there. This will be available after the course ends. Uh, it will be available to you uh, indefinitely. So in this case, it is no um, I mean, loss of keeping it um, act uh, actual and uh, accessible. So that's the wiki. Um, and you, of course, invited to contribute to it um, in a collaborative spirit. And the last one is also quite important. That's the progress page. So while you're doing your course, you also will bump into some of the exercises that Hans has prepared for you. You want to make sure that you understand some of the elements that were introduced, but also that you interact with the course. So in this sense, this is kind of for us a, a way to evaluate your progress in terms of uh, in integration and ac ac activity within the course. So we'll, we'll be able to, to, to check how are things going for all the learners? And at the moment, we have over 850 um, participants in the course. Um, and also, after you achieved a grade of 80% of um, exercises, you will be able to auto-generate your certificate of completion. And that option will become available exactly on this progress page. So once you um, go beyond the 80% mark, you'll be able to find a link to, uh, to uh, upload or get your certificate of completion for this course as well. And I think in brief, that's a bit uh, what I wanted to share. I see a few people having still, at least one person having his or her hand up. Um, so I think it's Justin. If you want to talk or have a question on this specific item, uh, you're, you're good to go. You can unmute yourself and uh, ask your question directly. Justin, if you want to have a, ask a question, now is a good time. Maybe it was by accident. So in that case, I think we can continue. So maybe I'm not sure if my colleagues already did, um, but I would suggest to copy uh, the link to all um, attendees. So maybe if one of my colleagues can uh, grab the link for the course and add it in the chat, um, that would be useful for everybody to access it directly from there. So maybe we'll wait for somebody to do that. And then I think if we can go to the last slide, where again, you can find that information. I think we're looking, yeah, maybe the last slide here again. This is the link, of course, the second link is a bit easier to type, but we'll make sure you have the two links in the chat. As you can see now, I see my colleagues already have a good collaborative spirit because I see several people already pasting it in the chat. So thanks for that. And I hope we can keep up that collaborative spirit during the course. Uh, maybe also to mention that for us, it's also kind of a base course. Um, I think that um, for us, we we see this as a, as a critical skill on which we would like to build additional capacities. And, and of course, we will see with uh, the staff of IG and specifically with Hans and the team to see what additional courses we will bring uh, that could connect to this course. And at the same time, um, we may put this course as a precondition for further learning, either physical courses when uh, the COVID condition allows or um, further online courses. So it means that having this course done will be kind of a uh, precursor for further capacity building. And of, of course, we can uh, gauge from you uh, additional interest that you may have, and you can put that in the coordination, sorry, in the evaluation form at the end of the course. If you have any suggestions for further learning, we're happy to hear it from you. So I think I will just uh, stop here uh, with uh, this short introduction uh, on the online learning platform. You're happy to explore further. 
And of course, if you have any questions, you can also uh, um, write us an email, openlearning at unesco.org, uh, if you have any technical problems that uh, arise from the platform itself. So I think with that, uh, I would like to go to the uh, last um, session. I see one more hand up and just check. Uh, Ayuba, you would like to uh, ask a question? If so, you're good to go. And I have one more question after that. So Ayuba, you should be able to unmute yourself and speak. If that's your intention, you can do so now. If not, I will go to the next one and you can still come in later. So that would be Matunyawa. Matunyawa. I also see that person having challenges. I have a few more hands up, so I just have to continue. I also, Solomon, I'll unmute, you can unmute yourself if you have any questions. Okay. Solomon, Matunyawa, Ayuba, or Justin, if you want to take the floor, the time would be now. If not, then we will continue with the final remarks. Okay, I, okay, I see Solomon, you raised your lower your hand. Okay. So I think for now, we, we don't have any further questions. So we'll um, finalize this webinar and initiate the course. Uh, and uh, I would like to give the floor to um, the head of the section, Hydrological Systems and Water Scarcity uh, in UNESCO headquarters uh, under the Intergovernmental Hydrological Program, Dr. Anil Mishra. So Anil, please, the uh, floor is yours for some final comments. Thank you, Kuhn. Can you see? Yes, we can. Please go ahead. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you very much. First of all, happy birthday, Hans. Uh, it's uh, what a celebration. Um, at the height of this webinar, I saw more than 317, if I'm not mistaken, participants uh, celebrating your birthday with the uh, launching of uh, online course, Geospatial Hydrological Application. And within the framework of uh, CLIMWAR, which is Enhancing Climate Services for Improved water source management. Fantastic course, though I quote what you say, if you don't learn, someone will learn, and definitely. And this is uh, something that, uh, you know, I became nostalgic when you were presenting uh, the course uh, in my lifetime, I was using Fortran and uh, VBasic and, and other languages, the Python was not there at that time. So it's a, it's a fantastic uh, uh, technology and to learn particularly uh, to generate the data for climate services. So I would encourage all the participants. I just want to reflect a couple of things within the framework of this climate, uh, climate project. We uh, enhance climate services and, and build a data knowledge base. So this is along the line of uh, IHP's intergovernmental uh, program, which is, by the way, moving into the ninth phase, science for uh, water uh, secure world in a changing environment. And, and within the framework of ninth phase ISP, uh, with, with members, we will be implementing activities to enhance scientific research and innovation, water education in fourth industrial revolution, bring data knowledge gap. So these are the areas that will prepare uh, with this skill uh, for the member states. So I would encourage again, and participants to, to sign up for this course. Uh, AD reflected that we are off the track, STG, off, um, um, meet STG goals off the track, and there is a global accelerator framework, and particular capacity development, innovation, improve data and innovation, and UNESCO volunteered itself uh, to contribute to capacity development. And in that sense, as uh, we've been talking to you at IHG with the member state, with the um, uh, university in Brussels to come up with new ideas. And last year also UNESCO came up with the open uh, science recommendation. So within this framework and, and the, uh, the 
implementation that is done from here, Harare office is fantastic. We can really replicate these ideas and so um, and printed in open, open water network. Perhaps we can have a course on uh, uh, this uh, hydrological uh, application in e-master's program that she presented in which UNESCO IIT is co uh, collaborating and we will continue to collaborate. So once again, uh, I'm sure this was uh, many months of preparation um, undertaken by Harare office in coordination with IHE, uh, with, with all the other colleagues involved. So I would like to thank everybody and also um, IHE for collaborating with UNESCO. And there are much more to be done and uh, we will continue to work with you. And best wishes to all the participants so that you can get your 80% mark and get the certificate. And as Kun said, perhaps this could serve as a prerequisite for the next level of course that ISP will continue to work. Thank you very much and all, we all the best. Thank you very much, Anil. And I think uh, with those uh, final and closing remarks, I think we can uh, finalize this uh, quite successful webinar. I think uh, we were uh, reaching up to three, 300 participants uh, at, at the height of the meeting. So I think this was a very good attended um, webinar. And I hope also that um, you enjoyed the course as much as, uh, as I did myself. And as I said, that it will be a starting point for further work on open science and, and open applications for water resources management. So thank you all for your attention. And we look forward to working with you in the next few months during the course execution. Thank you all and uh, see you soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.